ההרצאה הבאה היא של תום, תום ארו סינלר, ויש לו משהו מעניין לספר, אני אתן לתום, ולב נו ואת הרעם. Can you hear me without the microphone? Can you use it? It's better for the camera, I think. For the camera? Yeah. Okay. Or you can just wave your hand. Okay, so, hi everyone. As you can see, this presentation is named Site of X. I'm hoping I'm not repeating too much of what I did said. If I am, just bear with me. We'll take two minutes. Okay? So, my name is Tom. I'm a data scientist from Similar Web. I'm part of what we call the data analysis group. We're a bunch of researchers and uh, data engineers. We have four different teams dealing with engagement, meaning traffic, how, my, how many visits do we have for each site, traffic sources, where do they come from? Is it search, is it uh, direct, is it from social site? Apps, it's a completely different area in similar web. We do website and mobile web plus applications and now we have a new team called audience here we do mostly demographics gender um, interests of the of the visitor of the visitors and things like that okay um, when we say big data I'm not bragging here we're talking about at least 2.5 terabytes of data okay millions of users each of them we collect browsing history and you'll see in a minute but that's the kind of scale we're talking about, okay? So it's, we have a whole stack of uh, big data technology, which I'm not going to talk about, meaning um, data collection, that's crawlers and things we'll see, we'll see later, and of course, distributed uh, computation, which we use a lot. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about that. What, we can't, what we, I am going to talk about is um, uh, basic research we did and some cool things we found. Okay? So, this is similar way what we do. We give for every website and for every mobile app different metrics. Basically, we measure the internet. Meaning, we want to find out how many users we have for each site. How long did they stay? Where did they come from? Where did they go? And what they searched for before coming to our site. That's the kind of information we give. We call it market intelligence. Okay, that's the brand name we, we give. As you can see, there's no one here from Similar Web because we're holding a meetup in our place, so I'm the only one standing here. Um, and we do, in the realm of data science, we do two, we deal with two main areas, starting with statistical inference. That's what we did historically. We have really good statisticians, not me, really good statisticians, they do engagement metrics, desktop, mobile apps, traffic sources, we try to define the percentage of users coming from different sources and on the part of machine learning statistics as well right we do uh, we try to find out demographics categories for each side audience interest okay what were they interested before coming or what kind of uh, audience each site has and something very important and this is presentation is going to deal basically with this the similar sites Similar web was historically named similar sites. We started with the basic idea of me trying to find a website similar to mine. Not really easy, and there's different ways to go around it. Um, what I'm presenting here is one way of doing that, okay, which we're testing right now. Okay, let's introduce our data. Where does all this data come from? We have different kinds of sources. Okay, so let's start with ISP data. Everyone knows what's ISP? ISP, the internet provider. Okay, internet service provider. Bezek, bot in Israel. Okay, um, that's ISP data. Crawler data, we have crawlers. Okay, they try to search, for example, for keywords and see what results come out. That kind of stuff. Direct measurement, that's our learning set, meaning Google Analytics, everyone knows it. GA, we call it. Google Analytics is the service that provides me with the measurement for my own site. What is the, st the strength of the email web? We, give you the, we try to give you the information of sites that are not yours. I'm Nike, I want to know about Adidas, okay? That's, um, but 
we do use sites that share their Google Analytics with us. We use it as a learning set to build our own models. Okay? And the most important part of our data is our international panel. That's what we call it. Panel, we make millions of users that we collect data from. In a moment, we'll see exactly what kind of data we collect from them. But this is the main advantage that SimilarWeb has. We have a huge, huge millions of users that we collect data from. Okay? And we're going to deal with specifically that data. The data that we collect from the panel, in our terms, we call it clickstream. Clickstream is, is a known term from the, uh, from the web, and it means you can read it here. A clickstream is the recording of the parts of the screen a computer uh, user clicks on while web browsing or using another software application. Meaning, Amazon has its own clickstream. What is it? We search for a product. The user clicked here and then went to the all um, to the recommendation he has. That's the click stream of the user. In our terms, what we mean by click stream is the browsing history, but defined by pages. Meaning, we started with Google. I searched for Thailand in Google and then opened the Wikipedia page for Thailand. From our point of view, similar web, that's the click stream. Each one of this is an event. Each one of these pages we call an event. And we can define the previous page corresponding to the current, OK? So we, I started with Google, went on to Google. Now Google went on to the search result, results page. Now Google became my previous. And when I clicked on Wikipedia, the search results page became my previous page. Yes, please. Uh, how can you obtain such a big screen okay, without some malware, let's call it? You're correct. That's the note. And I have to say it here we collect with absolute permission from the user, meaning we give some kind of service, the user approves us collecting the data, and that's the way we collect it. Okay, but it's all... It's the software installed at the user... Uh, yes, yes. And the easiest way to, uh, to explain it, for example, we, we don't have it, but everyone knows Adblock in Google, in Google Chrome, right? In Chrome, we have Adblock. Mm -hmm. Adblock is a plugin that we install in Chrome. By default, by its own definition, Adblock has to know exactly what page you are, right? Because it has to block the, uh, the advertisements in that page. To do so, it has to collect the data about what page each user is. It has to. It has to know. Yeah. Okay. Well, yes, but if you check if you check in Adblock, you approve them, collect the data so that they can improve, for example, their own algorithms, right? We don't own Adblock, but that's the kind of software that we use. Software where the where it has the permission to collect the data and the user gives us the permission, he knows that we're collecting the data. Okay. Well, isn't this affects the democracy of uh, the kind of users? who only click, okay, yeah, I agree. It does, it does, and we have... So you cannot analyze, let's say, more technical users who are aware of, uh, uh, let's say, this uh, type of extensions and avoid them. The answer has two parts in what you're saying. First of all, yes, we do have a bias in our panel, but it's actually more techy than what you think, because who uses that kind of plugins? Mostly techers. Okay, so, but in order to cover that bias, we have different sources, different kind of plugins, and we try to have it as uniform as possible. But of course, yes, you do have a bias, and if we were Google, we, uh, we would have known all that, but we have to do our best, okay? So what we do is have different sources, and we try to have it as uniform as possible, and correct the bias that we have in each source. Okay? More questions? Okay, so what we have to understand from here is the click stream, the basic building block of our data. We stopped talking about similar web and I'll talk about NLP. I'm saying here in a nutshell, but it's not really in a nutshell, it's in two sentences and I'm really overly simplifying the whole realm of NLP. But I want us to be on the same page when we talk about stuff. Okay, so what is NLP? It's an attempt of computer science to deal with Natural language, right? Natural language processing, meaning I would like with my computer to understand language, text. Okay? It focuses on how to program computers to process large amounts of text, natural language. The basic building blocks of NLP are letters, characters, from that we build words. Words 
build sentences, and these sentences we group into documents. Basic knowledge, okay, nothing too, uh, nothing too uh, complex here. We have different levels here, right? Sentences could be paragraphs before being documents, and documents could be word, uh, books, but it's important that we understand this hierarchy for now. What kind of uh, task we're trying to, to solve with NLP? All kinds, uh, starting from part of speech tagging, translation from English to Spanish, from Spanish to English, back to Hebrew, text to speech, meaning we speak and the computer understands what we're saying, uh, sentiment analysis, what we're talking about here is text processing, embeddings, okay? And since I didn't really know who we'll have here, I'll explain in one slide what we, what we mean when we say embeddings. And we would like to compare two different words, right? So, in this example we have milk, dog, and cat. Three words, okay? It's pretty obvious that dog and cat are similar, but milk is really not. But when we ask where is cow located in this axis, we couldn't really say, right? Because is it more of an animal or more of a producer of milk? We don't really understand. So we would like to have a bunch of numbers that represent each word so we can compare on a different scale, on, on the same uh, dimension, on the same realm. So what we do, instead of having one single number, we have a bunch of numbers. Technically speaking, we have a vector. Okay? This bunch of numbers represent different features, usually. Historically, they're features, okay? So, we can see that dog and cat are more similar than milk. Specifically speaking, as a dessert, what we do is cosine similarity, not really comparing each of the values, we're comparing more the direction of the, of the vector, okay? Our recent attempt to do so, what I did talk about in detail before, is word to vec word to vec seems like the go-to algorithm right now, but really it was published in 2013. It's not really that old. Okay, we had different techniques before that, but word to vec made a very important assumption, and that's the that's the most important introduction of um, of word to vec. What is that assumption? That the meaning of a word can be derived from its, from its content and not the actual, from the context and not the actual content. What does that mean? We don't have to define the word, we can simply look at the words around it. And that's a really big assumption to do, it's not, it's not that obvious, right? In words it might be, but we'll see later that it's not really such a, a, a basic assumption. But that's what word to vec did and it proved to be uh, an amazing algorithm. How does it work in two sentences? So we take a really big corpus. What is a big corpus? Wikipedia, Google Books, newspapers from the history of the world, okay? A really large corpus of data, and we look at a single sentence. That sentence we scan in a window, meaning we have a center world and the words around it. We want to define two, as I said, by the words in its context, okay? Where does it appear? This way we scan the whole text and we try to predict the probability of each word around the center word to be there. Meaning, if I see her, what are the probabilities for each word around the word her? Mm -hmm. Questions up to now? You all know it. You can skip it. It depends, and it's a hyperparameter that you have to tune depending on your task. The default value... Okay, but the default value is really usually the most algorithm is two from each side, but you can play around with it depending on the task. And it's a, actually a really good question to ask how big of a context do you need for your specific task. In text, two around the word produce pretty good results. So, so if uh, in, uh, in the language some words do not uh, usually come close enough to this window, mm -hmm. the algorithm will not, let's mm -hmm. say, uh, two words like uh, lady and park here, mm -hmm. and let's assume all ladies allow parks. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, if, because with language drama, it never comes uh, nearby, mm -hmm. then the algorithm will not detect. Right, it will not detect it, but that's the whole assumption behind it. It means that if, it, if they don't appear that often close to each other, 
then they're not saying the words. All, all the sentences have here, whereas lady appears, also park appears in the same sentence. Mm -hmm. Because lady only both parts. Yes. Yeah, but, but if the words are near the uh, distance is, is uh, uh, what? I don't know. So uh, if, if it's always uh, between them and the words between them are similar, then eventually it will be in the same area because it will be similar to the same bunch of words, so it will still be in the same area. Then it's talking about distance. So that will come from its being uh, uh, close to the second word, and that will. Come so you, to the you mean like ladies always go with dogs to the park? Yeah. And uh, then we will have ladies to dog and dog to park. In, in this example, yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, so we do that, I'll skip it around, I'll skip a bit. Well, it's not really important, what we have is a shallow neural net where we try inputting one word, we try to output the probability for each of the words around it to appear. That's one way to do it, that's one way to do this, the word to make, it's called script graph. There's a whole, there's a different way to do it, meaning from the context we derive the actual center word, and that, in that uh, method, we input two, her, two, and then, and try to output dog, okay? We achieve uh, similar results. Okay, uh, after doing that, what we receive is a representation of size k for each word, meaning we were able to reduce millions of words, or actually hundreds of thousands of words in the English vocabulary, to a vector of size k, best, the best um, word to vec right now is from Google, it has around 300. Uh, different features for each word. Uh, sorry, the, hmm? the, the words uh, around the, the word dog changes. So yes. So you have, uh, for the word dog, you have different uh, n, k, k, n uh, vectors of size k, right? No, no. What we do, I said, we take Wikipedia and we scan with a window like that, create all the pairs around dog, and then train the network with all the pairs that we receive. Doing that for four iterations, you receive the you at the end you achieve these vectors, not while training. What happens with the word park, for example, if there's a dot after that? If there's dog after park? No, if there's a dot. After park? Yeah, what happens with it? Like it's, it, it depends dot. on it depends on, on on your own algorithm. Usually what we do is split sentences by that period and we just for park we give only two and then and we don't have the words appearing to, uh, to the right Okay, but it depends. Um, okay, so once trained, and this is the famous example for a uh, word to vec, we can do mathematics with words. That's the whole point of it. What can we do with it? We take the word king, we subtract men and add women. What do we receive? Queen, Queen right? And row minus Italy plus friends, Paris, and, and word to vec is really good at doing that. Okay, that's what happens with word to Great. That's my whole introduction of NLP. No more NLP, but what does that have to do with similar work? So, our goal is to obtain meaningful embeddings for each side. That's the baseline. We start with the embedding for each side. Such embedding can be used later to, uh, to uh, find similar sites to deduce who also visited, visited that site, maybe for categories and a whole bunch of different activities that we do. So in word to vec we talk about words, right? Cat, lady, uh, likes. What do we have inside to vec? Sites. Okay? That's my word. That, these are my basic building blocks. It's a huge problem because in the English language I said we have 300,000 words. In the internet we see at least 30 million unique sites per month, and we just define each site as a word, you'll see it becomes a big problem, we'll talk about it later. But we have words in word to vec and site to vec sites. In word to vec we speak about sentences, right? The lady likes the cat. In site to vec we speak about browsing sessions, meaning from the moment I started browsing, what was my session? We define that as a sentence, okay? So the sites along that way are my sentence. In order to make, we say documents, right? We, we speak about the whole document being a bunch of sentences. In side to fact, what we speak about is clickstream, browsing history. That way we can define a user, yes, please. Don't you consider content at all in the sites? Not, no, not now. 
Okay, I'll, I'll explain why we do that, but for the basic site of vector. Okay, so let's give a good example of what happened. Okay, so here we have time. This is the full URL. What we do is we take that full URL and we cut it to what we call the top level domain. It's a problem that we'll talk about later, but we cut it into that top level domain. So we have Google, Google. We reduce it to a single visit, we call it. Then two sites in Meetup, and we reduce it to meetup.com. Why not? And Sport5. What we achieve now is a sentence. Okay? So we took the series of events that we collected from the users, reduced it to top level domains, visits, and on that we can now train our word to vet model. Okay, so we started by doing that and we received some pretty amazing results. For example, for Bank of America, what do you expect we received? Other banks. Other banks, right? Chase, Wells Fargo, City, Ubank, PNC, those are the sites that we received. But we started also seeing a problem already on the first test. Geektime.co.io. You all know the site? Yep. You all know it, right? Yeah. High tech guys. Um, so, Geektime.co.io, what kind of site do you expect to receive? Meetup.com. Meetup.com, maybe, right? What else? Facebook. Maybe, maybe Facebook, no. but actually what we received is a 10 business, the most similar site to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm guessing you know why, right? Because we said we're training on context. We're training on the context around. And high tech guys, we go to Geek Time, and the same kind of guys also visit on the yeah, same session 10 business, because that's yeah. the lunch usually. And they also check the chat, the taxes, maybe the how the, uh, how the economy is going, right? But that's the kind of problem that we're receiving because we're not defining similarity. We're saying it's probably similar, but it's not really the definition of similarity. Yes? The market and calculus makes sense because most of the postings on Geek Time and all of these sites are similar. Right. But Tenbis would be because of traffic, I think, right? Tenbis because because of because traffic. Because the mostly. traffic behavior is, is the similar same, yeah. around gig time around Tenbis. Mm -hmm. Okay, because it's the same kind of user. What? <laughs> okay. So we're doing lunch. The question: of What is your question here? If the, if the question is sites that people go when they have a break at work. So maybe that's more, uh, You're not looking, up, but I'm not defining, I'm just saying yeah. what's the most similar site and what we receive is a problem. For example, another problem that we have, very similar sites to banks, for example, Bank of Berlin. The most similar site is Israel, but it's not really the same kind of site, it's not similar. It's, it might be the same user behavior, but it's not a bank site. One is a credit card site, the other one is a bank. You do different kinds of activities on it. Okay. Is it, didn't it surprise you that you even got Chase in retrospect? Because if I go to Bank of America, then why would I go to Chase? Well, it depends how, how you Unless think you about... Like five okay. It depends how you think about where to vet. Because, say, my usual routine in the morning is I go to Ynet, and then I go to uh, check on my sport site, and then I visit my bank. You do the same, but when you go to visit the bank, you go to Mizrahi, and I go to Bank of Poilin. But the context is the same, and, and we define it by context, right? So we expect Banca Poalim and Mizrahi to be the same, okay? To be similar, at least. Okay, so it, it depends how you look at it. Yes. Remy, per geographic? We'll say it in a moment. We'll say it in a moment. Okay, um, so that's the first problem we have, because it's not really language. There is a mixture between what we call similarity and what we call affinity. One is being close together and one is being similar. Okay, so here we see an example of good affinity and here we see an example of good similarity and it's difficult to separate them. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> now we'll see what we got. Can you hear me? Everyone can hear me? Yes, just not at least something. Thank you. Um, okay, so this is the galaxy of websites. Okay? Uh, each dot represents our top level domain. Okay? And we'll start looking at it. Okay, so let's look, for example, at a, a clothing store. 
So what you can see the result here, Mongo, H&M, Bershka, these are all, these are all clothing stores. And if you look, let's see, let's see. Okay, if you look at what's close here, you see a cluster of Zara, okay? This is ex results that we expected, okay, similar site. But now, let's start looking at some different things. For example, booking.com. Okay, so booking.com, you see the same cluster behavior here. Yeah? But you do start seeing different sites in different clusters, okay? And that refers to your geographic question. We have booking, but here we start seeing airfrance.fr, the French site of Air France, and it's farther than the American site of Air France. American.com, uh, airfrance.com would be close to booking.com, but airfrance.fr is now far apart. Why? Because we start to see, we said we, we train on user behavior, right? And a French user behaves way differently. It's a different, completely different sentence from an American user. Okay, and the Japanese is even more difficult. Okay, so we start seeing that we have some geographic information. And when you take it back, for example, let's go for dot, dot JP. Okay, dot JP, everyone knows what it is? Japan. Japan, exactly. So you see, Japan is really clustered together. And the best way to look at it is when we go to Google. Okay, when you go to Google, each Google in Israel, we have Google COIR, right? It defines the Israeli cluster. And the same way, it defines each and every single country. So you can see that if the whole graph lights up like a Christmas tree, right? Because Google it appears in every single cluster. And if you look, for example, at google.fi, you'll see FI pages close to it. Okay, it makes sense because we're, we're dealing with user behavior. Okay? So, going back to our king minus man plus woman example. Where's the proof? Was that a, a, an internal tool, the visualization? Or yes, it? it's an internal tool, but you can all use it. Uh, I'll explain later. It's a Google uh, open source visualization. It's called, it's called Google Projection, I think. Google Embedding Projection. You can use it. Okay, so we have the Real Madrid, I'm a Real Madrid fan. Uh, so, realmadrid.com. And we would like to do this, this action. If we had language, it would be very easy because we'll take Real Madrid minus Spain plus the word England and expect to receive what? Manchester. Manchester, right? But we don't have that. We don't have Spain and we don't have England. What do we do? We switch them. We take out Spain, add google.es, the Spanish Google, and remove, excuse me, remove google.es and add google.co.uk. And what you get is actually Manchester United not only Manchester United, you get Liverpool, Chelsea, and Manchester City. Okay, so we were able to translate from a local page to any country that we have through Google. With simple action using the Google vector. Okay? Cool. Now, this is what we were able to achieve. We played around with I don't know how many examples did it with banks, with newspapers, with everything that we wanted. And we actually received some really cool uh, translations from one site to another. And talking about geography, we did some local uh, models as well. They weren't always that, uh, that, better, that much better than more. Than more what what yes. is the letter at the end of the domain? Which one? Yes, Espana. No, you have like asterisks after uh, realmadrid.com. Ah, right? here? Yeah. Oh, that's an internal, uh, that's an internal mic that we use. That's, I told you, we, we collect pages, right? So we have all the different pages inside. We group them all together into a top level domain and we mark it with an asterisk at the end. Okay, that's why I had to use that, but um, that's not real. Okay, there's no real thing. So, 
this whole, I, I told you, I'm, I'm going to talk about research, yes, please. You used like a semantic hack here, because you used the Google, Google like a centroid of all the, of all the cluster, of mm -hmm. the country. Let's say that, that you wanted to do this uh, arithmetic in uh, another domain, like uh, uh, Real Madrid minus uh, football plus basketball. Mm -hmm. how, how would you have done it? Uh, Real Madrid minus football plus football. We have to, to find pages that are distinct for that domain. So, for example, I would probably think about minus FIFA plus NBA. Or minus FIFA plus, plus a Eurobasket. Yeah, okay, okay so this could be uh, uh, translations that you can do. Okay? Yes, please. You are talking about top level domain, mm -hmm. but you also have subdomains. The easier having like finance.yahoo.com, which is easy because it's similar to high level domain. But sometimes it's not static, but dynamic. Let's say, let's take a look at Alibaba, mm -hmm. and you have all the electronics products page, pages, right. which are dynamically created by, by database. And uh, you have some kind of uh, domain clusters within the same domain. Right. Because maybe they are, they are more similar to electronics shop. Have you played with this also? Yes. Um, you actually okay. two slides ahead. Uh, we so, have so I'll wait. So I'll wait. Two slides ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about it. I'll, I'll remember. And I'll talk about it later. Okay. So first of all, I'd like to invite you all to play around with this tool, and it's really easy. Okay. We played with a whole bunch of different tools. At the end, what we suggest is using basically for the easiest word to vec uh, application that you can that you can do. Just use GenSim, really easy to use, really great tutorials, and you achieve some pretty good results without that much of, a, of an effort. Okay, so GenSim is the, it's a Python library, uh, really easy to use. We found it the easiest to use, so I would suggest using that. Spark has its own applications, and we at the end we had to use Spark because we're dealing again with really large amounts of data. GenSim is only local, so we have to collect the entire data set that took a whole bunch of time, and then running it on a CPS. You're still running on your own data centers or on AWS? Right now, we're, we're currently migrating, migrating to, I know, but, to AWS. But still, this ran on Spark and on-prem uh, data centers, right? It's on-prem data, yes. Your we have on-prem in, in, in the yeah. US, mm -hmm. okay? And we have, uh, I have through SSH. I no, no, of course, of course. I'm just asking, like, which infrastructure ran all of this? Mm -hmm. Okay, so GenSim can be run on your personal computer. There's actually no advantage of using GPUs on GenSim because it's mm -hmm. it's not optimized for it. Okay, Spark actually does it locally too. Okay, so Spark isn't really good for the uh, training part, but for the collection. Mm -hmm. Okay, it does, you can just give it an RDD if you know. Okay, so you can just give Spark an RDD and, uh, and train it on a word to vec And I would suggest just play around with it, think of your own applications to it. There's endless uh, types of applications to word to vec And that's what I wanted to say on this slide. <coughs> we also have some open questions that we still are trying to answer. So you asked uh, previously about the period. Okay, the, what's the best way to split the session? In, when we're talking about browsing history, it's even more complicated because it's not only a period. First of all, we don't have periods at the end. But on the same computer, a husband and a wife could be using the exact same computer. Each of them is a different session and a completely different behavior. right? So we have to think about a good way of building our sentences for uh, training the model. But the husband is using a computer. <laughs> <laughs> and Google knows. Um, Related to your question, is a worldwide model better than a country level model? Um, it depends. The answer is it actually depends. In language, for machine translation, you would train a model with English and Spanish, but for any other usage, you would never mix English and Spanish, right? You would train a model in English, train a model in Spanish, and try to translate between. When we speak about behavior in the internet, it's different because Although we do have local sites, Amazon.com is a global site, and now we have diff we have users from different countries using the same site. So, is it better to train it only for local sites, or only for local users, or we do want to see the global trend on it? And the internet being global, 
many times it's better to train it on the whole, uh, on a worldwide model. Another good question is how do we update the model recurrently? We were talking about estimations, we, similar way, we give estimations daily. Daily we have to know something changing the site. But word to vec traditionally, you just take a whole bunch of text, offline. train it once, offline, have your vectors and now use them. Here we have to train it every day. So is it better to update or to create a new model? Or um, do we keep, if, if we train throughout the month, is what happened a month ago still relevant to the vectors that we're seeing today? You can continue, you can continue the training, but it, 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 it still has a, it still drags the, it's yeah. a, it's a bias, the temporal bias that Adi talked about earlier. You still trained on previous data that... Uh, oh, but you can do, I don't know, like use some kind of an LNM, but you can forget what happens in the, uh, in the past and the... Uh, the yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, RNN is good for temporal dependency inside a sentence. I wouldn't think of an RNN throughout the month being given temporal uh, temporal importance for I mean, but but an RNN also creates an embedding. Right. So, but what what would you pass through the RNN? It depends. I mean. You could train the RNA on a session, but you would achieve the same embeddings or similar embeddings to what you're receiving here. What I'm talking about is, say the elections happen in the, in the US at the beginning of the month. So we would see a spike of uh, new sites and probably highly correlated right-wing sites or left-wing sites with new sites, okay? So Fox users would probably go to Breitbart in the US, okay? But that would be really close during the elections and probably they start spread, they'll start distancing themselves as we move through time. I'm not sure that you can model that correctly in an RNA. Okay? You would have to give it some some kind of date parameter and, and it would still be a problem. Okay? Um, what we found is that it's better to just keep adding more examples and letting the letting the, the network do its own uh, its own work. And the, high, the biggest advantage of that is that we still talk about, we don't have to uh, rotate the, the dimension that we have because we're already training on a specific, uh, we fixed the vector and we just and we just adjusted it through time and it's better that way. Um, not sure it was, uh, it was a good explanation but we can take it off. Um, does the model accurately, accurately reflect current trends? That's another big question because in order to do what we did, we had to have a month of data. Okay? Does it reflect uh, changes throughout one week? We don't really know. And how do we add semantic <coughs> content knowledge to it? We're still thinking about it, and we have different uh, different different experiments that we're doing. With. Yes, please. Uh, two questions. Um, do you keep in mind like? Um Special periods like holidays or something like that that browsing history may may vary, that may change. Um, That's one. There was an attempt to do it. Um, not really successful. But we we were able to. Um, not really. Ha it doesn't have anything to do with working But we were able to correlate between spikes in specific sites with an event, of the holiday, for example, or it does Black Friday. <laughs> Hmm? You may have something specific with World to Web because your sentences might, like your browsing history sessions might, may, might be different. Yes, but um, it could be. Another way to look at it, for example, Amazon is really is always a good uh, measurement for our sites. Users in Amazon, they may go, uh, they may go more often in holidays to Amazon, but if they want to look for a review, they'll still go to the same site. They might be, they might do it more often, but they will still behave the same, usually. Okay, so close by sites to Amazon remain nearby even on holiday. Okay, and uh, another question: Did you um, consider, like, if you were in a specific website, if a user were 
was in a specific website and he had external link like, I don't know, from GeekTime to the marker. Mm -hmm. So maybe you want to, I don't know, remove it from the yeah. sentence because it's not like right. uh, natural behavior of the user. I did really explain the, the data. I said we have current, right? We have the, we call it queue, current side and the previous side. What we also have is what we call an href, okay? An hyperlink reference which means the site that we went through, for example, advertisement. We don't really want to model advertise tabula, for example, or outplay. We don't want to model that because it's simply linked from one site to the other. It's not really relevant to the user behavior for this kind of model. So yes, we do take it out and we are able to, uh, we are able to, to filter it out, uh, the, the reference in links. We actually did. Yes. What does semantic uh, content mean in your... Uh, For example, keywords. Each site has its own keywords. Each site has its, its own tags. Okay, uh, definition of the site. So basically, I mean, word to break variants uh, are built to accommodate for arbitrary context, you know, so I guess your experiments you're running are different ways of plugging in... Of adding, of enriching. Yes. Data, right? So we have, this is a really good start, but now we want to adjust the vector so that, for example, Islakar, silly for the English, uh, Islakar and Banco Poalim, okay, we want to separate them. Even though word of gave us many close vectors, now we want to start separating. Islakar is more similar to Visa and Banco Poalim to this. The way to do that is enriching the data with content, semantic uh, uh, Semantic knowledge. Yes, please. Another question? Yes, sorry. Um, I'm not sure I understood. Like, did you solve the issue that big time is similar to tennis? We're on our way to solving it right now. Um, as I said as I started, this is not yet in production. It's simply the starting a starting point, um, and we're currently looking at different ways. They tried using, uh, we tried using tags and keywords already, and we were able to get better results. And we also tried using the Wikipedia uh, information. If you have it, for example, Ynet has a Wikipedia uh, value on the website. So we were able to extract that and use it as an enrichment to the word vectors that we, that we already have. And we're trying different uh, approaches to it. How do you measure your success in this? And that's uh, not yet. That's the best question here because we actually really, except for Google, no one has the kind of information that we have. So it's really hard to define what is good similarity between sites. What we do is mostly beta testing. Beta testing, we have beta users that you, for example, we developed a new algorithm. So we send it to them and receive feedback because there's actually there's no good way of defining it. And each time you think you did something good, something else, something else, you, you find that um, that sites appear and result and we result uh, with similar sites and, and they're not actually that similar. So it's mostly trial and error. You, okay. but there's no good benchmark for uh, site similarity or even site accuracy. So they actually but recognize can this feedback mm -hmm. into yeah. your uh, data? We data? have, there is, there is, uh, there is a, we have better users for similar web. They receive, when we develop a new feature or a new algorithm, we send it to them, receive feedback, fix it, and then, and then. The uh, feedback is data, data or it's like just, you know, No, feedback is, mm -hmm. we're not accurate here. I or I see here that you have a problem. Um, but there's not much more than we can do because there's really no good benchmark for it. Yes, please. Is it hierarchical? What? Which? The definition of similarity. Of similarity? Yeah. Um, no, what's hierarchical is the category of the site. Yes. But that's different from, uh, from similarity. We can use this to derive category, but not the other way around. We first derive what's similar, and then we group it together into categories. That, yes, we have for news, for, for example, for media, you have different subcategories. But that's how I could it. Two steps. Yes? If I understand correctly, uh, regarding the geographic locations, mm -hmm. what you do is like, um, take uh, 
So choose a, a geographic location, mm -hmm. take the website from the same geographic location and train your model on those sites. That's how you get like a... It's the... No. It's the other way around. If we, want, if we want to develop a geographic model, we will take users that we know are from that country and use their browsing to train them on. Yeah, okay. that, that, sorry, that's what I meant. Okay. Okay. So, why don't you... Uh, I like the, the fact that you take sequences of websites. Like, mm -hmm. uh, first Google and then uh, uh, what goes out. Uh, did you try... Uh, <coughs> The dimensions for, for example, the amount of time you spend on the same on the same website. Maybe it can, it can tell you something regarding the website and its the similarity. For example, 10 bits. You don't really. Uh, if I if I, uh, uh, I don't know read something around uh, on CNN or why it took me kind of the same time. Mm -hmm. Let's say the same. The, both of them were in English, mm -hmm. but in 10 bits we will spend less time. Okay. You didn't see some people trying to decide what they want. I don't know, but, but there's, a, there's, a, there's a difference, you know, because you, you, as I mentioned, it, you just, you, you picture, you plot a graph, mm -hmm. right, the sequences. Right. You only uh, uh, consider the, the jumps from one, uh, from one point to another, but you don't take the, the gamma, the trend, 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 trend. strength, mm -hmm. or uh, the du duration. Right. Or other features. But yeah. there's, again, that, that's a uh, heuristic that we have to check. Okay? That's, it's, uh, it, it's continuing with this question. How do we split and how do we create our data set? Okay? We started with the most basic idea of we don't care about time. We don't care about how much time was spent. We simply want to know the sequence of he went here, then here, then, then there. But there is a whole different heuristic, for example, that looks at pages and not visits. What I define, what I define here, I'll show you. Google defines uh, estimates to sites based on an object called visit. What is a visit? I entered Ynet. If a half a, if half an hour passed from my entrance, since I entered Ynet, that's still considered the same visit. If more than half an hour passed and I was idle, then we start on a new visit. But on Chrome, we have tabs, right? So we can open Ynet, go to a different site, and then come back to Ynet, and that will still be considered the same visit. From our point of view, wait, where was it? Okay, here, if that happened, then we would have said Ynet, then a different site. But it, actually what happened was Ynet, Sport, and then Ynet again. Okay, so that could be considered a different heuristic and might be better than what we tried. But what I'm explaining here, and, and yours could be good as well adding the dimension of how much time was spent. Yeah. I'm not sure it makes it better, but we are trying different. We, we haven't tried it, if that's it. Okay? But that's simply a heuristic and how you build your data set. Okay, what I wanted to show here is the, uh, the, the concept. Looking at it. Yes? What is your suggestion? How can you take into account, how, how can you take into account the contextual uh, data? Um, the contextual data? The additional data. What I found, and it's fairly limited because we're just trying with it. Um, first, training it on a basic, uh, on, on a basic structure, kind of like this. Getting those embeddings, and then using them as features and adding the features, for example, of tag words. Okay, so we use the vectors achieved here, and then we add New dimensions for the semantic. Uh, is this what you call embedding? This, this is the embedding part. Which this? Yeah. Yes. What we what we achieve here is an embedding for each side. Okay, a bunch of numbers for each side. Yes, please. This is seems like fascinating uh, information, mm -hmm. and it can be used for researchers. Mm -hmm. But is there any uh, business case that is repetitive enough? For this business, uh, for this data to be uh, business worthy. What the uh, this site? Uh, yes. Are there enough organizations that will buy this data, for example, or what? Of what course. kind of recommendations? Can you what from similar web? This kind of uh, cluster. I Galaxy. wouldn't. I, I don't use it. I'm not presenting this cluster specifically. What I'm using it is as a basis to derive 
good insights on site on, on sites. Okay. I'm using this as the building block for later features okay. that uh, that we do sell. What is the business model? <laughs> <laughs> Let me finish this and we'll talk about it later. Sure. <laughs> um, one second, just a quick point that I wanted to say. The computability issue in word to vec it's really the go-to algorithm right now for, for, a base, for a good baseline. But what we're dealing with is something that is not really talked about in similar web, which is the size of your vocabulary. In English, we have 300,000 words. Maybe we're using digrams, duos of words. We have a million, 1.5 maybe, and that's good. Here we're talking about 30, millions, 30 million distinct words per month. New? Not new, <laughs> but 30 million distinct, at least 90 million uh, that we have. That's computationally looking at it, it's really hard. What you try to do is you have a trade-off between size of vocabulary and the dimensions that you, that you achieve. But there are possible solutions and that might be a good... Uh, a good thing to look at. Uh, Yao, uh, Yao presented this in 2016. It tried to uh, it tried to create a distributed model of word 2 vec and actually achieve some pretty good results. I'm not going to go into it. But what we're now researching is an uh, is this paper that came out in February this year called URLNet. What they try to do is actually. Um, they deal with the infinite vocabulary of the internet uh, and the way they did it is starting to look at it on a character level. Okay, so we have a convolutional layer that looks at the URL from the character level and that way it achieves a really a pretty good embedding and can actually look at sites not on the top level domain, that goes back to, to your question, it looks at it on the URL level, on the page level. So I can, this, I can achieve a completely different embedding for finance.yao.com and sports.yao.com, they're a completely different site. What I presented here gives me exactly the same embedding for finance and sports and that's a problem. But using this we're now, we're now trying and I'm hoping that on the next meetup maybe I could present this. Um, we actually are able to receive, to achieve embeddings for a site and for an infinite number of sites using this and uh, I suggest you read it because it's really interesting the way they did it. Okay, so what does similar web do? Um, basically it's the BI for the internet. You have your uh, department for example in uh, digital marketing for Nike, as I said earlier, and you want to know the activity of Adidas. You don't have, you can't have information about them because they don't share it with you. The only way to do it is using platforms such as similar web or uh, similar uh, platforms. Another good use case is you want to research keywords. Okay, what are the kinds of keywords that go to your competitors' pages and maybe and maybe uh, pay for uh, pay for a promoted keyword in uh, in Google? That's another use case. I'm not really the guy to talk about it, but that's uh, that's what similar web does, and it's actually I think pretty successful at it. So um, that's it. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them.